Most of you who read these stories and have been to India will know that the word sadhu is used to describe a holy or devout man. In its more colloquial use, it is merely a term of respect for a recognized gentleman. Another word in the context of this story is valley thafu. That means a banana plantation. But the sadhu or holy man of valley thafu was not just a man in a banana plantation. He was a tiger that lived in the foothills of the Nilgiri Mountains and haunted the road, the fire lines and the jungle stream that skirted a large grove of bananas. His claim to this seemingly inappropriate appellation came about through a chain of rather strange and apparently unconnected circumstances that began almost a decade earlier. For at that time, a sadhu wandered down the road one evening, presented himself at the grass hut in which the owner of the banana plantation was living, and demanded shelter. He said that he was on a journey on foot through India that had begun in the abode of snow, the Himalayas, and was to end at the southernmost tip of the peninsula. He also said he would stay for a day or two to rest, before climbing the Nilgiris to Utakamund. The banana grower, whose name was Kantha, was both honored and delighted. He thought that this visit from the holy man would bring him and his plantation good luck and fertility. He suggested to the sadhu that he should remain a week at least to rest his weary body before attempting the ascent of the steep gat road that lay ahead and he coaxed his visitor with a large dishful of delicious bananas spread with thick fresh cream liberally sprinkled with sugar. The itinerant holy one enjoyed the fruit and cream so much that he remained not only for the week for which he had been invited, but for many weeks after that. In short, he became a permanent resident and promised the banana grower his blessings and great productivity. If a nice hut were built for him and the bananas and cream and sugar were made a constant item on his daily menu, to be served fresh early each morning. The owner agreed for fear of reprisals, and the sad who settled down in his new grass hut, to a life of ease, meditation, and good fresh fruit and cream. It did not take long for the few Irilla tribesmen, working on the banana plantation, to observe that the newly arrived holy man was a queer sort of customer. After cooking and eating his evening meal, he would retire early into his hut and the faint flickering flame of an oil lamp visible through the interlaced bamboos that formed the walls of his abode would burn late into the night and sometimes all night long. On one occasion, after the holy man had been seen to enter, one busybody prompted by curiosity crept up to the walls and ventured to place a curious eye to an aperture to find out what was going on within. But the hut was empty the spy thereupon presuming that the sadhu must have gone out again unnoticed and hoping to catch him red-handed on his return, hastily made himself scarce among the closely growing stems of the banana plants and at a safe distance squatted on the ground to await the sadhu's coming and see what he could see. A few minutes passed and then a tiger roared loudly in the jungle just beyond the sadhu's hut. The watcher startled up in terror and turned to beat a hasty retreat to his own quarters. But fear caused him to turn round, half expecting to see the tiger in hot pursuit. But to his utter amazement, he saw the sadhu walk boldly forth from the very direction where the tiger had been roaring. Hastening back to the coolie lines, the spy told his story. What sort of man was this, the Arillas wondered, who consorted with tigers when night had fallen. Thereafter, they noticed that at night, a tiger roared in the vicinity of the sadhu's hut, and indeed all around the plantation, very frequently. From the timbre of his call, the animal was obviously a male. Other tigers there were in plenty in the surrounding jungle, both male and female, and their calls could also be heard at infrequent intervals, generally far away. But this particular beast was clearly a newcomer to the region and appeared to have taken up his abode in the jungle just beyond the limits of the banana grove. They frequently found his fresh tracks in the morning. They were everywhere, upon and beside the road coming down from Udakamund. 
along the banks of the stream all over the clearing that ran as a rough rectangle around the plantation, separating it from the forest. Even in the moist earth among the bananas and very frequently around the sadhu's hut. The tiger called nearly every night, particularly on the occasion of the Amavasa or new moon. And people were afraid to step out of doors once darkness had fallen. But for all these evidences of the tiger's close and permanent presence, nobody ever caught a glimpse of him during the day. The forest was full of coolies at the time. Some were engaged in bamboo felling, some in gathering the ripe fruit of the tamarind trees, and some on road repair work. Apart from the coolies, there were a number of Irilla herdsmen, employed to graze large herds of cattle and buffaloes, belonging to rich Badaga landowners at Utakamund, who had purchased grazing licenses and sent their herds down to the jungle for easy and economical feeding. These coolies were out all day with the animals, grazing them in the luscious spear and bison grasses that everywhere clothed the foothills of the Nilgiris. On all sides they found the huge, saucer-sized pug marks of the lone male tiger that called so loudly and frequently almost every night, and they lived in daily fear of an attack on their herds, which they knew was inevitable at any time in the near future. But the attack did not come. At least it never came during the hours of daylight, as might have been expected, when the cattle were out in the jungle. For then they were most vulnerable, scattered as they were in the thick mass of shrub, grass, trees, and bamboos. Instead, the tiger chose the hard way to take them. He did so at night, when they were supposedly safe in their pens, reinforced along the outside, with bundles of thorns cut from the jungle. One morning Budia, one of the Arillas, found a fine, fat, brown milking cow missing from among the herd, entrusted to his care. The wooden palisade was quite intact, but on the soft earth around it were the large pug marks of the solitary male tiger, showing that he had walked around the stockade, had deliberately selected a place where the stockade was a few inches lower, had jumped over it, killed the cow and jumped back at the same spot, carrying his victim with him. Clear evidence for these assumptions was found at the place inside the stockade, where the tiger had killed the cow, her flailing hooves had scored the earth, and there was blood on the ground that had seeped from her throat. Also, the top of the stockade had been broken in an outwards direction. No time was lost by Budia in telling the other herdsmen of what had happened, and that day was a busy one for all the graziers who devoted all the available hours of daylight to raising the height of the stockades. This was of course a considerable undertaking, as each pen had no more than two or three arillas to look after it. By the time all the pens in the area had been fitted with the new, higher and heavier palisade, the unwelcome tiger that had come to stay had accounted for four more cattle from the various herds, all of which he took by night and in the same way as he had stolen the first. These activities created panic among the Arillas, for never in the memory of the oldest among them had any tiger ever behaved in such a fashion. Having lived for generations in the forest, they were familiar with all the ways and habits of the carnivore. Marauding tigers and panthers had every year taken their toll from among the herds and at very infrequent intervals, a man-eater had appeared on the scene. Then terror had been their constant companion, till such time as, in one way or another, the reign of the man-eater had been brought to an end. But the tigers that had killed their cattle had all struck during daylight, when the herds had been taken out to graze. Here, however, was a tiger that apparently moved only under cover of darkness. They heard him at all hours of the night and they saw his pug marks each morning, but nobody had ever seen him. Why did he not launch his attacks during the hours of daylight, like any other tiger? And with that came the awful thought, if this tiger ever became a man-eater, their lives would indeed be in peril. His assaults and his method of removing his victims proved him to be an extremely cunning animal and quite fearless. While this was going on, tongues had been wagging, of course, they only spoke in whispers and after many glances in all directions, to ensure there were no listeners, was the strange sadhu 
on friendly terms with this wily tiger. Was it possibly he who secretly met the animal and instilled into him the cunning that had led him to prey upon the herds in such an unusual fashion? Quite soon all the cattle pens in the area, right up to the border of Mysore State, over 15 miles away, had had their palisades raised to a height averaging 10 feet or more. And the herdsmen anxiously waited to see what the lone tiger would do to overcome the problem that now confronted him. Then something happened that instilled even greater fear into the superstitious minds of the Arillas. About that time, a wild bull elephant had made one or two incursions into the banana grove, spreading destruction in all directions. Although the shooting of elephants is strictly prohibited, Kantha, the owner of the bananas, decided to make at least an attempt to protect his orchard by firing a handful of miscellaneous lead pieces at the elephant through his old muzzle-loading gun when the beast made its next raid and from a safe distance fire a shot to drive it away from his bananas and possibly deter it from coming back. Accordingly, Kantha concealed himself among his trees in the far corner of the plantation that the elephant had been raiding and awaited the coming of the ponderous robber. But no elephant came that night. Instead, the lone tiger roared nearby and then roared again. A little later, in the bright light of the moon, a slight movement caught Kantha's eye in the open space, separating the boundary of his land from the forest. He stared hard, and there, sure enough, was the stealthy form of an animal, emerging from the tangle of undergrowth. Kantha looked again. There was no doubt about it. Before him was the slinking form of a tiger. The tiger that had just roared. The lone male tiger that had been causing all the mischief. And which nobody but himself had seen so far. What an opportunity lay at hand. To raise himself sky high in the esteem of the Arillas. The distance was rather long for a shot with a muzzle-loading gun. If only he had a rifle. Nevertheless, taking aim as best he could in the moonlight. The owner of the plantation fired what he hoped would be the shot that would turn him into a hero. The shot did have far-reaching consequences, but whether it enhanced his reputation or lowered it is a debatable point. That at least one or two of the irregular bits of lead vomited forth by his old weapon. That night found their mark is certain, for the tiger let out a loud roar, followed by what the shocked man later described as an eerie scream and vanished with a bound. Needless to say, without further ado, Kantha hurried to his hut and secured the door tightly. The next morning, when the owner's son, a lad of about 17, brought the usual daily offering of bananas and cream to the sadhu, he was surprised to find the door of the hut closed on the inside. Upon the threshold and leading to it were drops of a rusty brown color. They had soaked into the earth, but the boy had no difficulty in recognizing them as blood. Timidly, he called to the old hermit. At first there was no answer. Then a faint voice told him to go away. The boy replied, saying he had brought the fruit and cream, and the sadhu answered that he was ill, and did not want anything to eat that day. His curiosity aroused. The lad asked if he could be of any help, mentioning that he saw blood on the doorstep and inquiring if the sad who had been injured. The only reply to this was words of fury. Wondering at this strangely cold and ungrateful response to his well-intentioned offer, the boy hastened back to tell his parents, fearing the outcome of his shot at the tiger. The previous night, Kantha had told no one of what had happened except his wife. Now his son's words caused him to think and to think hard. Half an hour's intense concentration on the problem resulted in what he considered a clever plan to find out if the grave suspicion dawning in his mind had any basis in fact. He hurried to the sadhu's hut, approaching the entrance silently on bare feet. Gently he pushed against it, noting as he did so the dried drops of blood on the ground. The door was fast secured from within. Taking a couple of paces to the right, he dropped to his knees and pressed one of his eyes close to what looked like a sufficiently wide aperture between the interlacing bamboos to permit him to see inside the darkened hut. Just then a faint noise to his left and above caused him to look up. The door of the hut had opened. 
gazing down on him, with a horrible scowl on his face, stood the mysterious Sadhu. His left arm, around the bicep, was roughly bound with cloth, and seeping through at one spot was the rusty brown stain of dried blood. Kantha rose guiltily to his feet and stammered, I heard from my son that you were ill, most holy one, and came to see if I could be of any assistance. Does that explain why you were peeping into the hut, O oh liar who cannot lie properly? Thundered the Sadhu. Then, go away, before something unpleasant happens to you, he hissed, slamming the door in the astonished Kantha's face. Rising hastily to his feet, the banana grower beat a quick retreat, thoughts of black magic and the hermit's dire revenge springing into his mind. A week or so later, the lone tiger took his next cow from one of the pens. As I have said, the palisades had been raised, so that it was now impossible for any tiger to leap over them into the enclosures, and doubly impossible to leap back into the forest again, burdened with the weight of a victim. So the strange tiger did the next obvious thing. He forced his way through at the base of the stakes by displacing a couple of them with his powerful paws. But in this case he was unable to return with his prey after he had killed it. The tiger tried to do this, but the carcass became wedged between the stakes and he was forced to abandon it. Thereafter the tiger became bolder as the Arillas living in the area became more timid. At this stage in the developments, apparently, through complete disregard for the human beings, with whom he came into contact, and recognizing the fear he instilled into them, the tiger changed his tactics. Instead of operating only after nightfall, he was now frequently seen during daylight, walking along one or other bank of the stream, or the fire line, that ran close to the plantation. Growing increasingly defiant, he began to pounce upon the herds of cattle that the Arillas drove into the jungle to graze. As a rule the herdsmen, who closely associated the lone tiger's existence, with that of the Sadhu living at Valley Thothu, the herdsmen did not attempt to go to the aid of any of their stricken herds during an attack. But there is always the exception to every rule. The tiger leaped upon a buffalo, one day in full view of a herd boy, who was grazing the animals. The buffalo plunged about in an attempt to dislodge his attacker, while the other buffaloes, as buffaloes often do, milled around in confusion, trying to aid their stricken companion taking courage from the efforts of his charges. The herd boy rushed in among them. With a snarl, the tiger left the buffalo and leaped upon the boy, who crumpled to earth with his attacker on top. Fortunately for him, that gave the other buffaloes the chance they were waiting for, and like a squadron of cavalry they charged the tiger, now fully exposed and within range of their formidable horns. The tiger did not stay to fight. He was off and away. By their action they had temporarily saved the life of the herd boy. All that night the luckless boy lay in the jungle, with none to succor him. But his buffaloes kept watch around him against the tiger's return. Next morning a few of the neighboring herdsmen banded together and started a search. They found the boy at last, but his multiple injuries and the many hours of exposure he had endured exacted their toll. He died before a conveyance could be pressed into service to carry him up the hill to the hospital at Utakamund. A long spell of comparative quiet followed before the next tragedy. In fact, many people thought the tiger had moved to some other sector of the forest. But one morning, an arilla saw a peahen suddenly launch itself into the air, from behind a large tuft of grass bordering the footpath along which he was walking, and flap heavily away. His mind immediately associated this action with the presence of a nest, and possibly a few eggs or even some pea chickens to eat, and the Arilla hastened towards the spot the hen had left. But the cause of the alarm that had frightened the bird was the lone tiger, and he and the Arilla met face to face, just beyond the tuft of grass. For the tiger it was a most annoying surprise, for the Arilla the last one on earth. For no accountable reason, the tiger struck him down and killed him. Then, perhaps as an afterthought, or through mere curiosity, he ate a small portion of the man's chest and gnawed a thigh. The tiger liked the taste of the flesh, 
And so that day, another man-eater came into existence. The consternation that had been growing steadily, with the lone tiger's increasing boldness now turned into panic, and the feeling became prevalent that the Satu, living at Valley Thothu, was closely connected with the latest incident and with the tiger himself. As regards the latter, there were divided opinions. A number held that the Satu and the lone tiger, that had turned into a man-eater, were on very close terms. Others felt that the man and the animal were one and the same. The Satu being able to take on the form of a tiger whenever he wished. Such an explanation seemed to account for all the mysterious events that had taken place. The coming of the tiger that had coincided with the arrival of the Satu, the wounding of the animal by Kantha, and the drops of blood before the Satu's hut, and the man's blood-stained, bandaged arm, the tiger's frequent calls and pug marks in the vicinity of the Satu's hut, his earlier clever and unusual methods of robbing cattle from the pens, and now the killing and partial eating of the Arilla. Incidentally, was it only a coincidence that the Arilla, who had met with this shocking and apparently quite uncalled for fate, happened to be the very person who had first pried upon the Satu and had started the rumors connecting him with the tiger. Surely, the Sadhu had, had his revenge. It was, a few days, before the Arillas were able to gather enough courage to visit the Sadhu, headed by Kantha, the owner of the banana plantation. They prostrated themselves at his feet, begged forgiveness, and asked him to beseech his familiar, the tiger, to spare their lives. Or, if he happened to be the tiger himself, to kill no more of them. The Arillas suggested that, if human prey were really essential to his diet, there were plenty of Badaga settlements a mile or two higher up the Ghat Road, or Karumba settlements a bare ten miles to the north, near the border of Mysore state to appease his appetite. The sad who appeared to listen to the deputation patiently, thought for a while, and then said that, if the Arillas agreed to pay him, a trivial stipend of a hundred rupees each month, in addition to a quota of rice, ghee, vegetables and, of course, the bananas, cream and sugar as before. He would consider visiting the Badagas or the Karumbas or both in preference to the Arillas. That settled it, they agreed. Had he not said, he would consider transferring his attentions. Without doubt, the Sadhu himself was the tiger. But where and how are they to raise the hundred rupees, the ghee, the rice and the vegetables? They muttered and whispered among themselves, then attempted to bargain for fifty rupees. The sadhu was adamant. Silently, they returned. A hundred rupees was too high a price to pay. Four days later, the tiger took another irilla. He was snatched a furlong from his hut, and that too at noon. Also, very significantly, he had been one of the members of the deputation. I admit, the preamble to this story has been long but I wanted to give a clear picture of the simple, superstitious minds of the aboriginal folk who dwell in the Indian jungles, and I thought the best way to do so was to tell the whole story, just as it was told to me, beside the campfire by the bank of the stream, a mile below where it skirted the valley Thafu Grove. My informant was a short and grizzled old Irilla named Bora, who had served me previously when I had visited the area on hunting excursions. The aborigine is usually very reticent to strangers, and one has to acquire the knack of getting on with them before they abandon their natural shyness and launch into unrestrained conversation. I well remember that night, in the jungle under a far-spreading mango tree, when Bora told his strange tale. We had heard the crash of giant bamboo stems being torn down by wild elephants. This, and of course the presence of the man-eater, it caused us to light a big fire, and to keep it burning, fed by a large pile of dead logs, we had gathered before sunset. It was cold, very cold, despite the leaping flames. We were huddled side by side, Bora feeding the flames, every now and then, while I stared steadfastly at the crackling logs on their mound of glowing embers looking furtively over his shoulder into the darkness of the jungle. As if afraid of being overheard, Bora 
told me the whole story, just as I have told it to you. Then, continuing, Bora said, Perhaps I should not have told you all this. It is said that, the Sadhu Tiger, and the spirit that protects him, as it does every man-eater, in a jungle, has ears everywhere and can overhear the faintest of whispers. In that case, the Holy One will be angry indeed, and my life will surely be forfeit, as if, in eerie response to his words. At that moment a tiger roared loudly, from across the stream and within a distance that I judged to be only a furlong. Bora stiffened beside me and then trembled like an aspen. The words stuck in his throat as he croaked. It is he, it is the devil tiger. The sadhu, the holy one, has overheard me. I am doomed. There was a nasty tingling, prickling sensation at the nape of my neck, as the short hairs there persisted in standing erect, and I felt the sweat break out all over my body. But putting on a show of nonchalance, I said unconcernedly, Nonsense, Bora, your words are but idle superstition. That was just an ordinary tiger, of flesh and blood. Maybe it was even the man-eater. But certainly no reincarnated or transformed human being, spirit or devil. Involuntarily, I laid my loaded point four zero five across my knees, and picking up my three-cell torch, I shone it into the darkness in the direction of the calls, paled by the glow of the fire. The little circle of light seemed pitiful in all that gloom. We waited in silence. Some time later, the tiger called again, this time from the same bank of the stream as ourselves and from behind us. He had waded across the shallow water and had come around in a half circle. I threw another chunk of wood into the flames, wondering if our fuel would last till morning. We had certainly laid in a good stock, but with the tiger's near presence, we would have to use more firewood than we had anticipated. There was silence after that second call. Deep, prolonged and uncanny, we began to long for the tiger to roar again. At least, if he did so, we would know his approximate whereabouts. This way, with no sound whatsoever, the beast might be a mile away, or behind the nearest bush, a few yards distant. Stealthy rustlings, inevitable in every forest at night, came to us from beyond the circle of light, cast by the feeble flames of our fire, and we conjured up visions of a dreadful man-eater, stalking us, creeping ever forward, ever nearer, inch by inch, till he came within striking distance, then would follow a short spell of agony and afterwards oblivion. We waited for the sudden, but expected charge. Stricken by fear, Bora kept up an almost unintelligible mumble. Now and then, I heard the words, Revenge, and neither of us will live to see the sun rise. This got on my nerves, frayed as they were by the story. I had just heard from my companion, closely followed by the tiger's nearby roars, and I almost shouted at the Arilla to shut his mouth. But this he evidently could not do, and his incoherent mutterings continued. A sambar stag bellowed on the stream bed. He was clearly very agitated and had either seen or smelt the tiger close by. Minutes later, a bull elephant gave vent to his trumpeting scream of fear, and the young elephants in the herd screeched like piglets as each sought shelter under its mother's ponderous bulk. The tiger was walking around us in a circle. He knew there were men within a few yards, but the light of our fire deterred him from coming closer to investigate. Then there was a continuing scream of terror, strident and loud, from the direction where the sambar had last called. With all his vigilance, the stag had not been watchful enough. The tiger was killing him. Deep silence that fell all around us, with the end of the sambar's dying screams. The herd of elephants tightly bunched together, with their calves in the center for protection against a sudden charge by the prowling marauder, had evidently melted silently away. There followed a nerve-wracking period of tension, till midnight, when the rising moon dispersed some of the dense blackness under the huge trees around us that clothed both banks of the stream. The darkness was not so intense now, and we could at least see a little, nor was there any evidence of the tiger. Laura and I became somewhat more composed, but he was in no condition 
to be entrusted with the responsibility of keeping watch by himself. And so I spent a sleepless night. The murmur of the water burbling and bubbling and rippling over the boulders on the stream bed. Lulling me towards a slumber, I struggled hard to combat. The false dawn arrived with the still lingering moonlight, deceiving a solitary jungle cock into thinking that daylight was at hand. He crowed once and then fell silent as if ashamed of his mistake. Then came the real dawn, indescribably beautiful, or those first few minutes of early light. Another day was born. I was sleepy and I was annoyed at having thus carelessly put myself in a position where I could do nothing. But who would have expected to hear so strange a tale? And who would have thought the lone tiger would make himself heard, if not felt so soon? Curiously, I was not angry with the tiger, but I definitely was angry with myself and with the sadhu who had so frightened these simple jungle folk. And I determined as soon as possible to confront the hermit in his own hut. Brewing a little tea, which I drank while munching the sandwiches, I told Bora very clearly that he was a fool to listen to such tales, and that I would soon show what sort of rogue the sadhu was. To that Bora replied, in simple words, Till this moment there was just one of us doomed to be killed by the holy tiger. That was me. Now, after your words, there are two. The second is you. That made me even angrier. It was just seven in the morning. When I stood before the closed door of the sadhu's grass hut, Bora shamefacedly behind me and called loud, Open, O holy tiger. That is, if you are awake yet, after your night-long ramblings, as if he had been expecting my visit. The sadhu flung open the door and stood before me, dressed in a flowing robe of saffron hue, his only ornament, a heavy necklace of amber beads, his long and oval face enhanced by his flowing black beard and fierce mustache, his expression displayed intelligence and determination. In even pleasant tones, the sadhu answered, As a matter of fact, I have just awakened my friend. I expected the white man would visit me after hearing the tale told to him by that jackal, who now slinks behind you. I saw you both by the fireside on the river bank last night and was tempted to eat one of you. But the sandbar they called did not get away soon enough, and I ate him instead. To say the least, I was thunderstruck. The man spoke as if he had really played a part in the previous night's drama. I knew, of course, there was a trick somewhere. No man could turn into an animal, and then turn back again. Although, I had heard such things many times, from the jungle aborigines. I had also read of similar occurrences, in tales from Africa. Here seemed to be the real thing. I decided to act tough, and take the sadhu down a peg or two. Listen, oh hypocrite, rogue and liar, dressed in holy robes. I began hotly. Your silly stories may frighten these simple irillas, but on me they have no such effect. You are a man of the meanest nature, having repaid the hospitality of these humble, honest folk with lying threats and greedy blackmail. Let me tell you this, O oh trickster, whose game is up. The tiger that called last night is at least a gentleman. You are nothing but a swine. He laughed. Why is the hunter so angry? Is it because he knows he is helpless? Then his mood changed, and the handsome features contorted to a scowl. Mind your own business, white man, and interfere not in what does not concern you, and you do not understand. For if you do, you will pay with your life. I have spoken. An almost uncontrollable urge came over me to smite that rascal with no further delay. I remembered in time that he was regarded as a pious man, and such an action would definitely land me in trouble. So instead, I said, take it for granted that I shall interfere, O teller of lies, and when you become a tiger, that you do not show yourself before the sights of my rifle. For if you do, I promise that you will indeed be a very dead tiger. Were you a very dead hunter? He rejoined quickly. 
Then the sadhu slammed the door of the hut in my face. I turned on my heels and strode away. At my side, Bora pointed out several fresh sets of tiger pug marks. They were hardly half a furlong from the hut I had just left. I led the way back to the wild mango tree where we had spent the previous night, opened my bedding, which I had not used, and decided to snatch a few hours sleep. But it was a restless, unrefreshing slumber, disturbed by dreams of a tiger with a sadhu's head. Shortly after noon, I awoke, ate some tin sardines, with the remainder of the stale chapatis I had brought from Udakamant, and while the hot water for tea was still brewing, sat with my back against the tree to consider the situation. Although I did not for a moment credit the strange tales that were being told about the sadhu, I had to admit I was confronted by a very curious sequence of events. The sadhu had said he had seen Bora and myself the previous night while he was in the form of a tiger and would have killed one of us had not the sambar stag got in his way and a sambar had indeed been killed. The night before, I had heard the stag's death scream with my own ears. How did the old devil know all this? Obviously, he could not have turned into a tiger. No man could. There were only three possible explanations. The first, someone had told him. The second, he had been watching and listening and had seen and heard for himself. Thirdly, and I abandoned the idea as soon as it came to my mind. The tiger had been his informant. That too was ridiculous. Nobody could have told the hermit, for nobody would dare to be afoot in the jungle at night, with a man-eating tiger roaring nearby, not to mention the wild elephants. Bora had heard, but Bora had been with me all night. That left only one solution. The sad who had been watching us, and had heard the dying cry of the sambar, if that was really so, I had to admit, he was a brave man, to be hiding in the jungle unarmed, spying on us, with the man-eater circling the whole scene. It did not require much thinking, on my part, to come to what I considered, the correct conclusion. The sad who was an opportunist, pure and simple, a decidedly clever, and courageous one, no doubt coming to learn from the Arillas that his advent to the locality had been followed by the arrival of a particularly bold tiger. He had very astutely decided to link the two events by creating conditions and circumstances that would lead to the opinion that he and the carnivore were on close and familiar terms, thus enhancing his reputation in the area and providing him with free board and lodging for the remainder of his life. Fate had then played into his hands by bringing about events that brought him into even closer relation with the lone male tiger that had come to stay. The sadhu had either been injured by coincidence when Kantha had wounded the tiger, or perhaps had not wounded it, or the sadhu had somehow come to learn of the shot that had been fired at the tiger and had deliberately inflicted some slight injury on his own arm, sufficient to draw blood from himself and give birth to the story that he and the tiger were one, and that he could change himself from human to animal form, and back again at will. Then the tiger had become a man-eater, the sad who had been clever enough to exploit even this development by levying the payment of a hundred rupees, together with various commodities as the price of leaving the Arillas in peace. No doubt he anticipated that if and when the tiger killed more Arillas, such happenings would simply enable him to raise his demands. His future financial prospects at Valley Thothu were bright indeed. It was easy to understand from all this that my arrival on the scene represented a serious spoke in the wheel of good fortune that had thus far favored him and looked like favoring him as long as the man-eater remained in the vicinity. For if I succeeded in killing the man-eater while he remained alive, this would once and for all explode the belief, held by the Arillas, that he and the carnivore were one and the same. Not only that, but the sadhu could never again hope to create such a train of favorable circumstances, here or elsewhere, 
this would be a serious blow to his reputation and would ultimately affect both his purse and stomach. People would pay him nothing, nor give him food. Doubtlessly, the banana grower would lose all fear of him and turn him out of the grass hut he was living in. Indeed, everything pointed to the fact that at all costs, I would have to be got rid of in some manner. The sad who had no doubt learned from my words that very morning that his threats would not frighten me away. Therefore, I could expect that he would resort to more direct action. If only something could be made to happen to me. What a boon it would be for his reputation. It would soar sky high indeed. People all over the district would wonder at the powers of the terrible Sadhu, who could turn himself into a man-eating tiger at will, and by whose magic even a white hunter had been eliminated. I realized that I was faced with two implacable enemies, a man-eating tiger and an unscrupulous human who would stop at nothing, and I knew that of the two the human was by far the more dangerous, because he could think. He could rationalize and anticipate my actions, and the Arillas would unwittingly help him. By keeping him informed of my movements, the man-eater on the other hand had only his instinct and jungle skill to rely upon. He did not have the capacity to reason. I also knew that whatever plans might be devised to trap the wily tiger, and incidentally the even more wily Sadhu, they would have to be devised and executed entirely by myself, unaided and in secret. I could not afford to take any of the Arillas into my confidence, not even my ally Bora, for although I knew they would be loyal to me, their superstitious fear of the Sadhu combined with the inherent long tongue possessed by all simple village and jungle folk would cause them to be garrulous at the least opportunity, revealing my doings to their friends. The sad who would, in fact, soon come to learn my plans. After some thought, I felt it would be the best to begin operations against the man-eater first, regardless of the sad who and what he might do. Because if I succeeded in killing the tiger, the sad who's reputation would automatically fall apart. Finishing the tea I had brewed, with Bora following, I led the way to buy a couple of buffaloes to tie up as baits for the tiger that night. That was when I really began to understand the malign influence that was being exerted by the hypocrite in the saffron robe. Doubtless, he had already anticipated my move and had taken steps by preying upon the superstitious fears of the Arillas. For the herdsmen flatly refused to lend, hire or sell a single animal. I tried hard to explain to them that, after all, my efforts to kill the man-eater were in their own interests and for their safety. They avoided giving me a direct reply to that point when I mentioned it, but countered vaguely by saying that, if they rendered any assistance to anybody engaged in attempting to kill the human in tiger form, as they called him, swift vengeance would fall upon them and their herds. Seeing that further argument was useless, we visited three more herdsmen in the area. But the herdsmen in each case repeated the same excuse. When declining to help in any way, a gray beard, seeing me turn away in anger, called to his companion and ordered him inside the hut to attend to some trivial task. As soon as the man was out of sight and hearing, the old man sidled up to me quickly and said, if you really want live baits, go to Massanagudi Hamlet, five miles along the road, and get them from there. For nobody here dare part with a single animal to help you, although we would like to do so. I understood the significance of his words, and pretended to leave in a great rage, just as his companion returned. The only possible thing to do was to follow the advice of the old man, but it was too late that day to go to Masanagudi and return before darkness set in. I would have to spend another night in idleness, by the fireside beneath the old mango tree. This time, Bora and I started early, and by dusk had laid in a very substantial stock of firewood, in the form of dead branches and fallen logs. 
with which to replenish our campfire and ensure that the flames were kept up until morning. We lit the fire when the shades of twilight deepened, for the man-eater might already be afoot, and in that uncertain light he could stalk us. By creeping under cover of the dark shadows, cast by the towering fronds of bamboos, and the tall wild mango and tamarind trees that bordered the stream to within striking distance of where we sat. After that he would pounce and we knew we could not see him coming. The calls of the roosting birds on this occasion entirely failed to bring the accustomed content to my listening ears for the simple reason that I had not been listening. My attention being divided between gathering firewood for the hours of darkness and a sense of mortification that the sad who had outwitted me by compelling me to spend another night of idleness without even a single live bait to sit over. Chuck, 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 chucku. The night jar, invisible now in the darkness, was calling from the further bank of the stream, and many of his kind soon joined in jerky chorus from all directions. It seemed as if a whole company of schoolboys had been let loose in the jungle and were deliberately throwing marbles upon a glass floor, each marble bouncing four times before slithering to rest. The chorus was interrupted by the harsh scream of a night heron in the distance. The time was approaching eight o'clock, when a hushed stillness suddenly fell over the jungle. Even the crickets seemed to stop their pulsating chorus. There was not a sound. Abysmal silence reigned over everything. The forest appeared empty of life except for Bora and me. This unaccountable lull acted as a prelude to an event that was as unnerving and unexpected. For suddenly, the tiger moaned three times in the darkness, somewhere by the stream to the south of us. Silence again, but for barely a minute. Then from the west of us, in the direction in which the road from Utakamund led away to Masanagudi, came an unearthly cacophony of sound. <laughs> Not loud, but clear. Bora, beside me, literally shrank with terror, while the eerie noise caused the tingling sensation of fright to race across my scalp. Then the spell was broken. Grabbing my torch and rifle, I leapt to my feet and raced towards that unearthly din. Gone were all thoughts of the supernatural. Common sense had asserted itself as I realized that the sadhu had blundered badly by giving himself away. For the tiger that had just been calling from across the river could not have covered the distance to the road direction in so short a time. The sadhu was trying to frighten me. No sooner had the tiger called than he had given vent to that raucous laughter to make us think the carnivore had already changed to human form. He had given himself away, and I intended to catch him red-handed. Following the wavering beam of my torch, I dashed along the narrow footpath that soon led to the roadway. I then turned to my left, towards the banana plantation, and incidentally the sadhu's hut. Only a short distance away, hoping to overtake the rascal before he could reach it. But evidently the sadhu could run far faster than myself. For I eventually arrived at the hut which was in utter darkness. Without a glimpse of him, I tried to wrench the closed door open. It resisted my efforts and I banged with the flat of my hand against the surface of closely spliced bamboo. After an irritating delay, I saw through the gaps in the bamboo the flicker of a lamp within. The light approached and halted and there passed a few moments, during which, presumably, the fastenings were being undone. Then the door flew open, and before me stood the hermit. This time no saffron robe adorned him. He was naked but for a brief loin cloth, and the string of large beads that dangled from his neck. I shone the beam of my torch directly in his face. Never for a moment did he close his eyes to avoid the light, but his lips curled in a derisive smile as he rasped. The white man can still run well for his age. But did he think it possible to catch the tiger's spirit? Exerting a tremendous effort to control myself, 
I replied, you run still faster for an even older man. But beware, O oh, trickster, the man-eater does not one day decide to end this farce by eating you. Before he could reply, I swung around to walk away and bumped into old Bora, who, unknown to me and afraid of being left alone, had followed hot foot in my steps. Without a word and in deep chagrin, I walked back to our campfire, my attendant close behind me. No thoughts of the man-eater entered my mind, only vexation at the ignominious way in which the sadhu had again made a monkey out of me. We spent another sleepless night, during which nothing happened, and in spite of our tiredness set out for Masinagudi, just after sunrise with the avowed intention of purchasing three live baits, which I intended to tie up for the tiger, with some considerable difficulty, and of course a great deal of bargaining and bartering. I managed to procure two young buffaloes, and a half-grown brown bull, which we led back to our campsite. It was then one o'clock in the afternoon, and I felt very, very tired. After the two sleepless nights we had already been through, to keep awake for another night would be impossible. We tethered our three animals at the base of the old mango tree, and fell asleep amongst them. I awoke at exactly four o'clock, the short three hours of slumber had nevertheless dispelled the sense of numbed exhaustion that had been creeping over me, and with only two and a half hours of daylight left, in which to make some sort of preparations, to try to meet the tiger, on equal terms that night. Now I want you to follow me carefully, for a little while, in order to understand clearly the lie of the land, for that has a very important bearing on what transpired subsequently. The main range of the Nulgiri Mountains lay to the south of us, but a spur in the form of a lower line of hills jutted out to the west. At the base of this spur and parallel to it was the road from Muda Kemund, leading from south to north towards Masinagudi. Then came a strip of scrub jungle, varying in width from a few hundred yards in some places to a mile, separating the road from the stream, which zigzagged along from the foot of the main range of the Nilgiris, to its confluence with the Moya River, over ten miles away to the northeast. All along and beyond the river was dense jungle. The Valley Thothu Plantation was at the base of the main Nilgiri range, and adjacent to the river, and as I have said, the man-eater appeared to have his home somewhere in this vicinity. That was common talk, confirmed by the fact that on the two previous nights, his first roars had come from this direction. Therefore, if I tied my baits in such a fashion that one of them was within sight of the road, the second within sight of the river bank and to the east of the road, and the third at the base of the low spur of hills that ran parallel to the road on the west, from whatever direction the tiger approached, he would be bound to blunder into one or the other. The only mistake in this plan was that there was insufficient time for me to tie out more than one bait that night and to build more than a single matchin before the sun set. Most likely, the tiger would approach from the west at the base of the low spur of hills. Of course, there was absolutely no certainty of this, for he might just as well come along the road near the sadhu's hut. It was purely a gambler's chance backed by a modicum of reason but my best bet seemed to be to tie the bait at the foot of the spur of hills. Making my mind up quickly, I joined Bora in driving all three baits to his hut, a mud and wattle affair situated in a small hamlet of half a dozen similar huts within two furlongs of the banana plantation. Here we left the two buffalo heifers and, selecting the brown bull calf, as the animal most likely to entice the tiger drove it between us to the base of the foothills. We reached our objective, a nullah, or a ravine, that I knew ran down the hillside, and turned eastwards to join the Segar River. The nullah was a favorite route, followed by the man-eater, on his hunting trips in search of animal victims, and these signs made me feel more optimistic about him. Choosing the nullah that night, on the top of one of the banks, 
Of this ravine grew what is familiarly known as an Indian oak tree. It has large leaves, growing in pairs, with clusters of flat bean-like seeds, and is a favorable tree for tying a matchin, as it has no thorns but does have a rough bark that enables the ropes that hold the matchin to grip firmly. Bora made a comfortable matchin in no time. We decided to tie the bull calf, about 15 feet from the base of this tree, but near the edge of the ravine so as to be clearly visible to any tiger either walking down the nulla bed 10 feet below, or stalking along the top. Before sunset, I took my place in the matchin. Soon the night fell and it was about 10 o'clock, when a tiger roared somewhere in the east, close to the sadhu's hut. I regretted that lack of time had prevented me from tying one of the buffalo calves in the vicinity of the road, as I had originally intended. That was when a perfectly insane notion entered my head. Why it did so? There's no justification whatever. It just did. Now that the tiger was calling near the sadhu's hut, I felt impelled to get down from my tree and hurry there as quickly as I could. Maybe I was beginning to half believe old Bora's weird story and wanted to see for myself whether the sadhu was at home or not. The tiger was still calling as I scrambled down the tree and jog-trotted towards the hut. It was less than a mile away, but so long as I could hear the tiger's roars, I knew I was safe from a sudden ambush. A segment of moon had arisen about an hour earlier, and by its light, although poor, I was able to retrace my steps along the footpath I had followed that evening on my way to the nullah. I reached the hut from the west, as the man-eater roared, somewhere near the roadway to the east. The hut was in darkness, was the sad who inside. Creeping up to it, I placed my ear to the wall of plated bamboo, endeavoring to catch some sound from within. But nothing could I hear, no breathing as of a man in deep slumber. The hut appeared to be empty. That was when the tiger roared once more. He was very near now in all probability walking along the roadway, hidden by the closely growing banana trees, less than a furlong to the east, than to entice the man-eater. I imitated the tiger's call, and immediately the tiger responded with a roar. Now the beast was coming towards me to investigate the source of the call. I quickly laid down near the hut, in the two feet long grass that surrounded me, all the way up to the banana plantation. I pointed my rifle in the direction of the tiger's call and was waiting for it to appear. Then, in the poor moonlight, I saw a bipedal human figure running. The man was naked except for a loincloth. Suddenly, the tiger attacked that man from behind. I stood up from my hiding place, lit my rifle torch and ran towards the tiger. The man-eater grabbed the man in its mouth. Now, the tiger was not more than 25 yards away from me. The man-eater looked at me. The man was still dangling from the tiger's mouth. So I took aim, right between the tiger's eyes and fired. The tiger dropped the man and fell aside. I fired again, although it was not needed. I walked up to the man who was lying in a pool of blood. The man was the imposter, the sad who, the man-eater had mortally wounded Sadhu. After some moments, the Sadhu opened his eyes and said, Oh white man, you won this time, but surely the tiger will kill you, and I will be waiting for you in the hereafter. Thereafter, the Sadhu died. Bora and other Irillas had heard the gunshots. Bora was awake when I reached his hut. I told Bora what had happened. At the same time, other Irillas also gathered there. Together, me, Bora, and other Irillas came back to the place where the tiger and the sadhu were lying dead. Up until now, they believed that the sadhu and the tiger were one, and that the fact that the sadhu could take on the form of a tiger was just a superstition. Now, they realize how an imposter sadhu used to make fools out of them. Warning, for non-subscribers, please subscribe or else the sad who will unleash its tiger form and hunt you down.